So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to two different passages. Um, the first passage we're going to spend the majority of our time in is going to be 2 Timothy chapter 4. So 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we'll spend the majority of our time. Um, but also go keep your finger there at Luke chapter 21. So Luke chapter 21 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to be bringing to you a word from the Lord that some of you guys may not want to hear um, because it means you're going to be having to do something. Um, sometimes it is easier to sit back, relax, and just absorb, and that's okay for a season. Uh, I was sharing with, with Brother Dave or before service that, you know, between my transition from uh, youth pastor to this position, uh, there's probably about three or four months there that I just sat in a church and just absorbed, listening to God, just sitting, absorbing. But that season was very short. I mean, there's a training season, but then there's an active season. And today we're going to be moving into the season of activity. Uh, and I don't think God wants us to be sitting back on our duffs and doing nothing. It's time to get our boots on the ground and our voices being raised. Amen. Amen. And so um, for the past several weeks, uh, I've been chewing on this particular message and every single passage, every single Bible verse that I come across of, they all kept pointing me back to the same direction, to the same theme, to the same message uh, over and over and over again, saying that we are living in the last days and to prepare our hearts to do the will of the Lord. And, uh, you know, depending on which side of righteousness that you stand on, um, hearing that the, uh, the end of time um, is coming it can give you two different emotions because if you're standing on the, on the side of righteousness where you're rebelling against God, that your righteousness is filthy rags and you're rebelling and you're not working or you're not serving the Lord and you are serving yourself or serving man, hearing the world is coming to an end can leave you very uneasy inside. And that's understandable because that means there's a judgment coming. Um, but those of you that are on the side of righteousness with me who has given their heart to Jesus Christ, we know that we're living in the last days, that we are, term we are the terminal uh, generation. When we hear about the last days coming, it kind of gets us excited inside because you know what? It's almost over. It's almost a time that we can rest and relax. But that time is not now, church. Now is not the time to sit back and relax and catch our breath and do nothing. Now is the time to be active in the Lord, active in the church, active in the world, proclaiming the name of Jesus everywhere and anywhere that he puts us. So the end is coming, we know that, but it does not leave us without hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ now and forever. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. So real quick, I'm going to ask you to stand back up with me. As we go to uh, the opening passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be looking at the first two verses in, in chapter 4 here. Um, and the majority of our text we built around essentially just three words. Let's read. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the, Lord that you, the word that you put aside in my heart. And I pray, Lord, that I am a willing vessel, Lord God, that you move through me. I ask you for the anointing of, of the Holy Ghost to be upon me to speak your message. And anoint those that are listening in this room and around the world. Let them hear your voice speaking to them, Father. We thank you, Father. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I love how direct Paul is with Timothy, Timothy here. You know, he did not pull any punches. He did not water down his message. Um, essentially, and this is the way I interpret it. This is in Jason's version. It says, boy, listen up. You have work to do. Go preach the word. That's the way I interpret this message in verse 2. Go do the work that I have commanded you to do. The one that God has ordained you to do. The, God, the, way, the one that God has positioned you to do. The one that He created you to do. Go preach the word. Is what, what Paul is telling Timothy. And, and the crazy thing is, this is not just written for Timothy. And we like to put things in a box. God will not be put in a box. The word of God will not be put in a box. We should not be put in boxes. When Timothy's being instructed to go preach the word, essentially Paul is teaching Timothy and us to go preach the word. Amen? I didn't know if you guys were awake this morning. I know it's early. All right? And see, Paul didn't just stop there and says, go preach the word, 
and he moved on. He went into greater detail. And part of the reason why I think he went into greater detail is because he knows that sometimes we don't get it. All right, I don't know about you guys, sometimes I need a little more details, I need a little more instruction, I need a little more you know, gumption to keep me going forward. And, this, and what Paul's telling, the, telling Timothy here is I want you to go preach the word. Now this was evident for Timothy's time, but I think it's even more evident for us to be listening to this passage in the world that we live in today. And I got evidence in this as we continue going forward. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll do 2 through 4 at this point. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instructions. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn... turn uh, their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. If that doesn't describe the world today, I don't know what exactly would, because there are so many false doctrines out there, false testimonies, false uh, theologies out there that the, that the world has injected into the church and the church themselves has bought the lie. They've bought the lie. You know, I don't, I don't think that you guys... Uh, actually, I think you guys would understand this, that the misinformation game that we see going on in the world is not only limited to COVID-19, to politics, to whatever else. The misinformation game has been here since the very beginning. And what I mean by that is the devil has used truth by twisting it and injecting it into the church, into the, the, the mankind. You can see that with the Garden of Eden, taking what God truly said and twist it to make them seem enticing. Remember, he says, you looked at the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and it was pleasing to the eye, it was appealing, it was good for eating. No. Sometimes the truth that we're looking for isn't always the nicest thing to hear, but it is the truth regardless. Right now, in colleges and universities across America, uh, you know, professors are trying to indoctrinate our, our students to change their minds, saying there's no such thing as God. Jesus is just a myth. There's, he may have just been a, a good teacher. There's no absolutes in life. And I would have to ask these same people, are you absolutely sure about that? Because from what I see in the Bible, there is absolutes. This is the absolute truth. You're not going to find truth flipping channels or going through the internet or anything else. The only place you're going to find truth is through the Word of God. And it's up to the church of Jesus Christ, you and I. This is not just a Pastor Jason's instructions. This is the church's instructions to go preach the Word. And if we don't do it, who will? We have no, we, we have no one to blame but ourselves if, if it doesn't go forward. We have an obligation, not just to each other, but to the future generations and to God. He put us on this earth to proclaim his good news. And I think we need to do it a little bit better. Amen? Amen. See, I think part of the church's fault and the, and the faltering of the church is we bought these lies. You know, it, it's, it's odd to think for thousands upon thousands of years, the church of Jesus Christ... Listen to the Bible, especially in Genesis, and said, okay, the six-day creation, it's a true fact. Six 24-hour days. That's the way it was. However, with Darwin coming into the mix, telling people, oh, you evolved. These, these, these six days is just a theory. It's a metaphor for six million years. Really? I mean, if you, if you really want to believe that you evolved from a monkey or a, a sludge in the bottom of the ocean... Man, you are gullible. You are gu I mean, that, that takes more faith than reading the Word of God in my mind. But here's what that happens. The church has a, a, adapted to that lie from the world and says, okay, we want to be accepting. We want to be part of you guys so you guys can feel more received from us. So we'll go ahead and go with the millions and billions of years. We'll bring in evolution. And then all of a sudden, we have pastors being ordained that are homosexual. And you wonder how we jump from here to there all of a sudden. No, it's been a process for lots and lots of time because the church sat quiet. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to embarrass or, you know, offend. I know that's the word for the day, right? Offend anyone. I don't care about people being offended by what I'm saying to them. 
I'm not trying to offend them. The Word of God does that on their own. If they don't like truth, that's 100% on them. It does not change the fact that we have a job to do. It does not change the fact that we have a truth to proclaim. It also does not change the fact that they need to hear the truth. They need to hear it. Even when it kind of stings a little bit, even when they know that they're doing wrong, they still need to hear truth because the truth will set them free. See, once you open up Pandora's box of sins within the church, there's no stopping it. We've seen that. I said this a long time ago. As soon as they started allowing the, 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 the LGBTQ community, when they open up that box of everybody's going to be accepted for whatever they believe that they are, where's the stop? No, there's no stopping to it. You'll see pedophilia. You'll see anaphilia. You'll see all kinds of perversion because the church sat quiet. It's time for the church to go preach the word the way it was written, with boldness, with authority, and in love. There's the key, in love. Because you know what? It'd be no problem for us to be the same bandwagon as the rest of the world with hate speech and everything else and shaking our finger at them, saying, you're going to hell. And we tried that for many, many years. You know, the, the fire and brimstone preaching, we tried that. It worked okay. And then we went to the complete other extreme about the grace, the hyper grace, the love and forgiveness and don't do what you want to do. We went from one extreme to the other. We forget that the whole word is, is important. We need the condemnation of the word. We need the conviction of the word. We need the loving grace, but we need the whole thing done together. You can't have appetizers and dessert. You need the main course right in the middle. Amen? Amen. God's word is not just a book full of suggestions or good ideas on how to have a happy life. It's a way to eternal life and how to live a life righteous before God. It's a roadmap for living successfully. Successful living. That doesn't mean you're going to be a billionaire, but it means at the end of the day, you will succeed. You will hear the great words, well done. And this book's the only way that you're going to find that there. I want to look at verse 2 again. I know we were just kind of chewing right on there today. I want to, I want to bring out to you the purpose of the Bible. What is, what is the word really written for? It says, to correct, rebuke, and encourage. Right? Correct. It means taking someone from the error of their ways and bring them into the right way, right way of thinking. And we all would like to do that with people, to show them love, show them encouragement, saying, okay, this is what you need to do, and this is what the Word of God says about it. Now, here's the cool thing about the Word of God. When it says preach the Word, sometimes we don't have to use words. Bear with me. Sometimes we preach the word with our actions, with our love, with our giving. Sometimes we preach the word by not saying a word at all. And I think that's what God wants us to do. Not just get behind a pulpit, not get on a corner of a, of, a, of a street one day and just proclaim the name of Jesus, which we should be doing. But we should be living the name of Jesus in every single thing that we do. That correction is done out of love and respect. And that interesting word there, rebuke, and that's always a, a tricky word, rebuke. That means publicly bring to their attention that they're doing something wrong. And sometimes there's a time for that as well. It's definitely not the best time to bring it up at Thanksgiving dinner. Trust me. So, I'm kidding. I didn't do that twice. Um, but sometimes it takes that. When the fire of God builds up inside of you so strong... And you say, you know what, it may be offensive to you right now, but you need to hear the truth. What you're doing is a lie. It's going to send you to hell. It's going to destroy you and your family. It's not pleasing to God. Sometimes it takes harsh words to get people slapped into the face with the reality to change their ways. But even with the rebuke, even with a strong rebuke, you do so in love. You do so in love. Because you're not trying to beat them down to destroy them. You want to see their lives change for Jesus Christ because you don't want to see them burning in the lake of fire. And that's where the decisions are going to take them. Knowing that we're living in the last days, church, should really encourage us to proclaim the gospel even more. Because we know what is at stake. Those of you that are saved and born again, praise God. When we get to heaven that day, I know that Jesus is going to say, well done, 
And then he's going to follow up the question, who'd you bring with you? I just made it in myself and I just sat back. It's all is required. Sure, sure. What did you do with you know, Matthew 28? Go make disciples making disciples. Where, where would you do with that verse then? It doesn't say sit back and do nothing. Preach the word with great patience and careful instructions. Patience. Anybody ever try to witness to somebody and it takes a lot of patience to get through to them? Don't look around, that's not nice. Um, it takes patience. Athena, I think you were sharing this with me last week. Mm. Patience, year after year after year, witnessing to a friend. And you know what happened? Praise God, received Christ. It's not about how quickly you can get to the finish line. It's that you're staying the course. Right now, many of you guys in this room have people on your heart that you know are not going to make it to heaven. You know that. You can see it evident across the board on their life. Don't give up on them. Be patient and endure with them. Chase after them. Show them love. Rebuke if have to. But encourage. Encourage. You can do this because you know what? Many people that I run into, they've given up on themselves. They say, this is the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. It's the way it's always been. How can I change? But when the word of God comes in and says, you're a new creation. You can do all things through Christ. All of a sudden, there's a change in their mind, change in their heart, change in their spirit going, I can do this. I can do this. And then they'll ask the question, will you help me? Oh, you better believe we will. That's what the church is about. Not just a gathering of saints on Sunday morning. That's additional to it. But we're here to work with one another, serve one another, encourage one another, love one another, walk with one another. Everything that we do should be done out of love and obedience to the Father. Amen? Amen. I was reading Proverbs 27, 5-6 through 6 in the Amplified Version. I really like the way it was written here. I'm not quite sure what I put on the screen. But it says, Better is an open reprimand of loving correction than love that is hidden. Faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Because they serve his hidden agenda. Sometimes we need to speak even whenever it's not real pleasant. Because we do so out of love. We love our friends. We love our family. We love those that are around us. We love our neighbors. And when we sit back and do nothing. Well, that's still speaking, isn't it? Not to speak is still to speak. It means you're condoning it. And you're like, okay, it's no big deal. Does that mean we have to beat every single person over the head with our Bible? No. But we do have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's calling. If there's an opportunity that pops up and you just happen to stumble across this conversation with somebody, it's not a coincidence. God's placed you there for a specific time, purpose, and he will give you the words when you need them. If you keep going into that verse there, it says, be ready in season and out of season. Right? Pastor Kelly loved that verse with me. I think sometimes he wasn't really prepared. So he's like, hey, you do this. Be ready in season and out of season. I think it might have been taken out of context, but it still made me learn something. That you never know when the call up to the major leagues, you're going to be ready. You might have been sitting the bench the entire season. But game seven of the World Series, he calls you up and says, hey, you're batting right now. Go. You better be ready, church. You better be ready. Because there's a reason that he have, has selected you for that moment. Because he knows what you're capable of doing. You may not. Maybe you have not really grasped the depth and the power of Jesus Christ inside your life. Maybe the anointing of God has not been so real that you realize the, the, the power that you have through Christ. But God knows it. You know who else knows it? The devil. That's why he wants you to be quiet. Don't say nothing. Shh. Just be still. Don't shush me. I'm a child of the king. Three of you got it. Praise God. You're a child of the king. And you're going to let some chump devil tell you to shush? Come on, church. Come on. The Bible tells us to preach the word. Not water it down. Not take away from it. Not to be still and be nice. Be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Flip over to Luke chapter 21 real quick, beginning with verse 25. This passage here took me on a rabbit trail that lasted an entire day and a half. And I'll share more of this rabbit trail on Wednesday at 6.30 in our Bible studies in Victory Hall, 6.30, Wednesdays. Did you guys get the hint? Good. So this rabbit trail that God took me on, it was just like, man, God. Begin with verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity. At the roaring and tossing of the sea, verse 26. People will faint in terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. In this passage, Jesus is explaining to us what to be looking for as signs in the heavens. And the word sign there is just something trying to be communicated with someone else. As you drove into the church today, you've seen signs all over the place. We have a large sign out there saying you have arrived. There's signs out there that says sharp curve ahead, dead end, turn around, no U-turn. There's all kinds of signs out in the world that's communicating with us. But only one person owns the stars, the moon, and the sun. That's the creator, God the Father, right? He owns those things so he can communicate with those things. So there's no one else that can take the credit or the glory that he deserves. And he's communicating to the church. He's communicating to the world saying, I am here. This is taking place. Pay attention. And what he's trying to communicate with us is the urgency for our, for our calling. It's time to pay attention, church, and listen to his calling. Looking in that passage, anguish jumped out at me. This means severe mental or physical pain and extremely distressed about something. That hasn't happened lately, right? No one else has been mentally strained on anything or physically strained. No one has been distressed about anything lately. This is exactly where the world's at. And this is not just COVID. This is about everything. The, the state of our, of our union, the state of our nation, the state of the world... The health, just families, the church, layer upon layer upon layer. There's people being in anguish going, what's going to happen next? I remember on 9-11, coming home after the second tower fell. And I was driving down the highway and I was looking at the sky, looking for planes, seeing these things. Then I heard the Pentagon got hit and then we had the plane crash. And in my mind, I go, what's next? What else is going to happen? And that was just one moment, one day in our time. And here we've been dealing with this COVID thing for two years. Or more, I don't know. It's been longer than that, it feels like. What's next? And we can sit and ponder on that. What's next? And we worry about that. And we let that anxiety build up inside of us. And it doesn't really matter what, what's next because we're still a part of the family of God. He did not give us a spirit of fear, right? He's given us a sound mind to make good decisions, to listen to his voice. The Bible tells us to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I think that still happens, doesn't it, Larry? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and take notice and say, you know what? I believe this book. I believe this book to be real because it's changed me. It's changed you and it's going to change the world. We can roll over and quit because what's the use? We already see the signs written. It's already done with. Or we can give the devil the fight that he was looking for and knock him right between the teeth. That's what he wants. And that's what we need to give him. That fight, proclaiming the name of Jesus. The devil will not conquer our families. It will not conquer Phillips. It will not conquer Price County. With breath still in our lungs, we are going to proclaim the name of Jesus. And we are going to preach the word. And if no one else is going to do it, that's fine. We'll still do it. Because the word tells us to do it. 
the good news is we're not alone. We have brothers and sisters around this world proclaiming the name of Jesus. I love that testimony, Dave. I really do, man. We need to hear about these great things that God's still doing around the world. Sometimes we feel just in a box, in our bubble, and like nothing else is going to happen because this is just our world. No. The world is on fire for Christ. The devil's trying to quench that message. It ain't happening. When Jesus comes back for his bride, it's not a rescue mission. He's not saying, oh, I better hurry and get them before no one's left. Man, we are looking, we are longing for it. We are ready to receive our king. And what a day that will be, amen? amen. Mm, don't live in fear. Don't live in fear. Keep going, Luke 21, verse 28 now. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the leaves. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. It's coming, church. So even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Praise God. Oh, praise God for that. Amen? Amen. Are things going to get a whole lot worse? Yep. <laughs> Sorry to tell you that. All right. Things will get worse before they get better. However, it doesn't mean quit. It doesn't mean roll over and just, oh, well, that's it. That's the way it is. No. We stay in the fight. We keep preaching day after day after day. Amen? Amen. Faith and fear are in constant battle with one another. And I know you guys have dealt with this. You've felt this. Maybe you're living it right this second. This battle between faith and fear. Fear and faith. Going head to head every single day. And here's what I want to explain to you. As you move faith into your life, it pushes fear out. Okay? The more faith you have, keeps pushing that fear away. However, when you allow fear to enter in, it pushes your faith out. We cannot push our faith out because where our faith is, that is the fire, that is the dunamis, that is the anointing of God. That's when we stop having faith is when we stop receiving miracles. People have asked me so many times, well, how come the Church of America don't see the miracles? No faith. No faith. It's time for us to go back to the Word, not just preach the Word, live the world, Word, believe the Word. Let it be a part of who we are, Amen. Now is a perfect time to evict fear out of your life. Today, right this moment. And the cool thing about this eviction, you don't have to give them a 30-day notice. You can do it right now and say, go! And move faith right in their spot. Let them clean up that mess that they left behind and praise God, you're a new creation. The devil would love for you to sit back and do nothing. He would love for that. We don't have time for that, church. We are the terminal generation. The tree is sprouting leaves. It's almost summer and it's almost time to go. Until that day, we have a lot to work to do. Go back to 2 Timothy 4 for just real quick. Verse 5, I'm going to pick up there. But you keep your head in all situations. That's a good one. I'm glad that God wrote it down for us to read over and over and over and over and over. And then tomorrow. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardships. I think he knew what was going to happen. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. These instructions did not just apply to Timothy. It did not just apply to his generation. That is for us here and now to, to apply to our lives, to activate, to employ all these different instructions, to keep our head in all situations. It'd be real simple to flip on CNN, ABC, Fox, whatever news you want to listen to and get your head so full of this hate and fear and what's going to happen and ah, oh, turn off the TV church. Amen. There's nothing good on there anyway. Open up a good book. I got one if you don't know where one's at and let it encourage you so that when we see things arising in the community and around the world and in our families, we don't have that anxiety build up like, oh, our king has it. 
Our King has it, church. There's no reason for us to fear and to worry. We need to keep on pressing, going on, going, 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 day after day after day. Because it ain't over yet, right? It ain't over. So keep going. Do the work of an evangelist. I like that. You know what an evangelist does? Anybody know? Preach the good news. Preach the good news. There's evangelists that go all over the country, all over the world, preaching the good news. And you know what happens when people reject their, their message? They move on. They don't get offended themselves. They're like, well, that's your loss. We have a job to do. Now, we can sit back and bellyache at all. They rejected me. They don't want to hear me. <gasps> no, get over it. Get over it. We have way more things to do than just worry about this one person that wants to be a baby about it. You know why they're rejecting you? They're not rejecting you. They're re rejecting Christ. Because there's something in their life that they don't want to get rid of. It's a sin, hidden sin that they're rejecting Christ because if they accept Christ, it means that has to leave. So if they receive Christ, praise God. If they don't, move on. It's a tough pill to swallow, I get it. Because we love these people, I truly do. But we don't have time to chase after every single person that wants to run out the back door. We have people that are hungry, reaching out for Savior, for truth. They're looking for stuff. Many of you have joined this church this year because you're looking for truth. You're looking for real God. I'm not real God. I'm just a pastor. You're searching for truth, and it's in this book. So keep on pressing. Do the work of the evangelist. And I love the last part of that passage there. Discharge all the duties in your ministry. All of them. Here's what that says to me. All right? My ministry is being the pastor. Your ministry is the rest of the stuff. So it's our obligation to... To be a part of ministry as a whole body. You have gifts. You have talents. You have all kinds of things that God has given you. Now it's up to each one of you guys to grab a hold of that. And say, God, what's my job? Why am I here? What did you give me the, 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 uh, uh, the anointing to do? And whatever that is, do it. Do it. Right? Don't just hear about it. Do it. Keep going, 7 and 8 in first, or 2 Timothy 4. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the, Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to those who have longed for, this hap for his appearing. I have fought the good fight of faith. On that day when we see Jesus face to face, and that day will come for every single person, whether you know Christ or not, there will be a day of judgment, right? Where we'll stand before God saying, okay, I'm here, what do you have to say? And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus himself is not going to say, well thought of, thy good and, good, good and faithful servant. Good intended, you know, mm, you tried to start something, but you really didn't start it. What Jesus is going to say to us is, well done. It's not about what you thought about, what you talked about, what you intended to do. And it's okay to make plans. You know, when it's saying, okay, what's next step, next step. But all, if all we do is sit around and have meetings and talk about pr production, but never actually doing it, what's the point? God wants to see us being doers of the word. Not just hearers of the word. Doers of the word. And this is what the whole message is based around. Go do the work of the Father. He has put you and I on this earth not to sit here, not just to absorb, but to share and to give and encourage and to rebuke and, and, to, and to just preach, preach the word in every aspect. It's our obligation, church, to do these things. It's our obligation to God and to mankind. The great president, Ronald Reagan, I love his quotes, by the way. This is going to be a quote from him. And some of you guys have already heard this once, but I want you to hear it again. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We did not pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be found, or fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do, in the same, to do the same. rather. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. 
This could not be any more true today than those words were spoken then. This is so amazingly true. That if the church of Jesus Christ takes that same principle, and if we decide to do nothing, the church dies. Point blank. It's on us. Jesus did not discharge the angels to earth and says, go preach the word. He didn't give it to the animals. He didn't give it to the trees. He didn't give it to anyone else except for us, his chosen people. He has put us, put us in positions of authority. He's given us positions of power. He's given us opportunities to share with our brothers and sisters and our family members, even strangers, to preach the word. And if we fail to do so, the church dies with us. So I don't know about you today, but I am not going to let that take place. I want God to breathe new fire into my belly every single day, to breathe new life into me. That with every last breath that I have, every ounce of energy, I'll be proclaiming the name of Jesus and preaching the word. I definitely do not want to get to heaven and say, well, that was easy. I want to go to the pearly gates with no energy left saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, for coming to get me. I did all that you called me to do. And now I have eternal rest. Now is not your eternal rest, church. We need to get up and do the work of God. So the question I have for the church before we close is, will you preach the word? Will you do it? Will you preach the word to the warped generation that has perverted every aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or will you roll over and quit? This is the decision each one of you guys have to, have, have to make. And I know you guys too well. I do. That was just a hypothetical question. Because I know none of you guys are going to roll over and just quit. None of you guys are going to roll over and die. You guys are fighters. You guys are winners. You guys are overachievers as it is. And that victorious blood of Jesus Christ is pulsating through your veins, the same as it is mine. You do not have quit in your heart. I know that. We have the, we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon us to go preach the word. And church, that's what he's called us to do, is to go preach the word to a generation that needs to hear it like no other. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.